Warning, we were going to do a profanity-free episode this week, but then we were like, ah, fuck it. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Honey, My Sheets Rock, and by the new recording medium for watching debates between people old enough to remember being too old to know how to program a VCR, Debatamax. Debatamax, for people so old that people old enough to get this joke can make fun of your age. And now, The Scathing Atheist. I am the Turnip of Terror, and as someone who spends free time recreating a period of history where I would be persecuted for heresy by saying so, I assure you we did, in fact, evolve from Filthy Monkey Men. It's October 1st. And it's International Raccoon Appreciation Day. Nice. The tiny bear dressed like the Hamburglar. What's not to love about Right? (laughs) I'm No Illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Chris Christie's, New Jersey, Cincinnati Swing State, and Cusman, Georgia, (laughs) this is The Skating Atheist. On this week's episode, William Barr designates the Bill of Rights as an anarchist-controlled piece of paper. (laughs) Tall Tyler throws him a fish for his good work. And Hillary Morgan Farrell set women's equality back on purpose for a change. But first, the diatribe. In the Bible, God spends a crazy amount of time trying to prove that he's the only God. Like I, I would say fully half of the Old Testament somehow revolves around God's perpetual, ineffectual attempts to prove he's superior to things that don't exist and consistently failing. And you got to admit, that's an embarrassing problem for your omnipotent guy to have. If you guys were like, you know, Noah, we like the podcast you put on fine, but we think we're going to go with this inanimate, shiny statues podcast and said, I would take that as a cue to get into gardening or something, but not God. He just keeps plugging away at it like that guy who's sure he'll have some artistic talent if he just buys fancier pencils. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. In the past, I have presented that very same fact as proof that God either A, doesn't exist, or B, sucks ass. But the more I think about it, the less I like that argument. So at the risk of dumbing this whole thing down too much, the argument goes like this. One, if God existed and was omnipotent, he'd be obviously better at all the God type stuff than gods that didn't exist. Two, if he was clearly better, the Hebrews wouldn't be constantly turning to figments of their imagination to do God shit without noticing that they were inferior. Three, Hebrews were constantly turning to figments of their imagination to do God shit without noticing that they were inferior. Conclusion, God doesn't exist. And as logical as all those steps seem, it actually is not a sound argument. In fact, there's a glaring error in premise number two that I'm embarrassed to have missed for so long. Premise two grossly overestimates the intelligence of human beings by ascribing them the demonstrably non-existent tendency to choose that which is effective over that which is imaginary. Hell, if premise two was true, I'd never have had to articulate this argument at all. Consider it with a quick substitution. One, if science was correct it would be clearly better at all the science type stuff than the shit that doesn't exist. Two, if science was clearly better, humans wouldn't be constantly turning to figments of their imagination to do science shit without noticing that they're inferior. Three, humans are constantly turning to figments of their imagination to do science shit without noticing they're inferior. And if that doesn't take all the wind out of it, try getting a little more specific and just plug in the word medicine for science. When we read the Old Testament for the Holy Babel segments or for Bible Peace Theater, we made jokes about the fickle allegiance of the Hebrews throughout. God would show himself to be God. He'd conjure up some rock water, moon the congregation, part of sea. Then a couple of years later, all the very same people would be going, yeah, but maybe this baby cow, though, right? Huh? You know, but is there any better analogy for humanity's relationship with science? Science cures polio. Humans thank God. Science builds airplanes. Humans pray that they'll work. Science creates modern medicine. Humans buy a book on medicinal humming from Gwyneth Paltrow. And despite science still being the only one to actually send people to the heavens, humans still ask preachers how to get there. 
Of course, an analogy between God and science is bound to break down early and often, you know, where God's strategy was generally to inflict his wayward acolytes with some kind of great calamity or whatever. Science just gets better at its job. You know, science keeps coming back with ever better iterations of truth. People linger in reality a little longer and more of more of them decide to stay there every time. Science chips away with every new discovery, every new invention, every new explanation. God started off perfect, which means, you know, he's as good as he's going to get. Science, though, can get better every fucking day. And it does. And it's important that we remember that it's important that we remind ourselves that we're living in unprecedented times. And we have been for a long time. History is cyclical, sure, but we've never known as much as we know now, and we've never known as much as we will know tomorrow. Religion seems inevitable to us. Magical thinking seems inescapable, but our imaginations are constrained by history in a way that the future isn't. Sure, it's, it's always been there, but that doesn't mean it always will be. In fact, our ability to chip away at it all but proves it isn't invincible. With enough time, a toothbrush can saw through a boulder and we're far enough into this process to see a pretty distinct groove. Now, it, it's a big fucking boulder, right? But we get a slightly better tool for every stroke. So even a small groove could be the sign of an imminent collapse. I know it doesn't seem that way from where we're standing right now, but we have to remind ourselves everything is immortal until it dies. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the marshmallows and chocolate to Mike Graham Crackers, Heath Enright, and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to give the listeners some more? I don't know, Noah. I've been burned before. Okay, that's the best part, though. The burned uh, marshmallow, <laughs> you got to burn it. All right, well, well, we go. Oh, oh, it's still hot, too hot, it's still hot, hot, hot. So much fun. Like a bunch of fucking idiots for a minute. We're going to pause for a word from our first sponsor this week. Honey, my dearest son, if you are reading this, I am dead. But know that I hey, always Eli. loved you. Eli, what you doing, man? Oh, I, I got to go shopping. So I'm just making a video, Will, you know, just in case. Also, oh, hey, hey, uh, this is Noah. He is your dad now. Nope, so nope, definitely not. Also, uh, why don't you just shop online? Yeah, I guess I could shop online. But won't I miss out on all the awesome in-person deals if I shop online? Not if you try Honey. I am trying, darling. No, honey, it's the free browser extension that scours the internet for promo codes and automatically applies the best one available at checkout. Ooh, that does sound cool, but how much does honey cost? You can get honey on your computer for free in two easy clicks. Just go to joinhoney.com slash scathing. Then when you're checking out on one of its over 30,000 supported sites, honey pops up and all you have to do is click apply coupons. Oh, yeah. You know what? Now that I think of it, I actually used Honey last week to buy a bunch of new onesies for my son. I saved like 20 bucks. Yeah, it's simple. If you have a computer, Honey should be on it. It's free and it works on whatever browser you use. You can get Honey for free today at joinhoney.com slash scathing. That's joinhoney.com slash scathing. All right, Noah. Thanks. I guess I don't need to make this video, Will, after all. Well, I mean, you do drink a lot of mango nectar. Yeah, that is fair. That's fair. And now back to the headlines In our lead story tonight. It's not that she's a goddamn Catholic. No. Nope, All right. Nah, but okay, fuck, I don't like that, Joe, though. Well, but of, Joe Biden uh, is a fucking Catholic. Yeah, right? I don't like and that I'm either. prepared to spend four years telling people that they should have voted for him. And yet that has not stopped one entire half of the American political spectrum from pretending that our concern of a Supreme Court nominee belonging to the fucking people's front of the Republic of Gilead is anti-Catholic <laughs> bias. In fact, criticisms from the left that generally took the form of repeating the words that she'd said led GOP <laughs> Senator Marsha Blackburn to tweet out the, this fucking ridiculous assertion, quote, in Chuck Schumer's America, only atheists can be Supreme Court justices. Really? End quote. Yeah, an assertion somewhat undercut by all of history plus now. Reality. Yeah. Reality. Yeah. 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 God forbid those in charge of interpreting the law of this country not have an imaginary friend like Big Bird. No, though, wouldn't right? want that. I mean, I'm sorry. I thought this was Chuck Schumer's America. Are we not in <laughs> Chuck Schumer's America? What the fuck? I'm going to fight a Little League dead. So, yeah, so quick reminder, in his time in the Senate, Chuck Schumer has voted to approve four Supreme Court justices, none of whom were fucking atheists. Three were Jewish. The other one was the same goddamn religion as Amy Coney Barrett. 
And that number would have been one theist higher, by the way, if Mitch McConnell hadn't taken time off of being characterized by a bony or cartilaginous shell long enough to block Merrick Garland's nomination. He, he has voted for precisely zero openly atheist Supreme Court nominees, which puts him in a 12,348-way tie for first place yeah. among historical senators. Would have been impossible to do that, literally. And listen, we're happy to nominate a theist. Barack Obama is Muslim. There you go. You <laughs> All right. But since any criticism of anything religious must always be treated as anti-Christian persecution, even after Blackburn was pilloried for this tweet, she went on to make the same goddamn claim on Fox and Friends saying, quote, we know the left is not going to be happy with someone of faith. They think you need to be an atheist or a secularist to serve on the federal bench. End quote. I think Fox and Friends must just have a sign in their green room that's like, say whatever the fuck you want. It's <laughs> open season here. Yeah, and then we'll say yes and, and then you say whatever the fuck you want again. We'll do that for a while, and then uh, after that, well, that's our show. Yeah, that's, 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 that's our that's, show <laughs> will begin after, yeah. And Dr. Phil will come on yeah. and tell you about science. <laughs> yeah, so to be clear, the problem with Amy Coney Barrett isn't that she's a theist. Yeah, you know, in a perfect world, you'd have to be able to correctly answer, does an invisible ghost king watch you pee to get a spot on the Supreme Court, right? But that's somehow unrealistic in our world, and we've accepted that. And when I say we, I'm talking, of course, about the minority of people on the left that get that question right. Like, of fucking course, the Supreme Court nominee will be religious, but that doesn't mean she has to be a weird-ass zealot who belongs to a misogynistic subcult, sign a statement affirming that life begins at conception, and openly talks about how the purpose of a legal career is, quote, building a kingdom of God, end quote. Also, side note, fuck the fact-checker sites that say that needs more context. There is no context <laughs> where that's not terrifying, and the context is she's a crazy goddamn fundamentalist about to be confirmed to the Supreme fucking Court. Yeah, she's not talking about Ninjago's brand new kingdom of God set. Yeah. There, there's not a good way... <laughs> There's no God. Okay, but if she was, that's that still sounds crazy. awesome. That sounds yeah. pretty. Sweet. That's on Lego in that situation. <laughs> and in coming from the far Leffler news, with the world on fire and a plague <laughs> sweeping across our nation, in preparation for a third, second, <laughs> maybe fourth, another, yeah, another ibid wave of illness and death, <laughs> Noah's senator yeah. Kelly Leffler has formed an evil supergroup of politicians to take on the issues facing our nation. By which I mean uh, letting trans kids play sports. The important issues. Great. Yeah. You'd figure she was busy with, you know, useful senator stuff, like resolving that elections are real or resolving that the Pledge of Allegiance is extra pledgy? What, what was that they did? I don't know. Where did she find the time though to do other stuff besides resolving important things? You know, I bet she's using all that time she saved ignoring the coronavirus relief bill. That, yeah. that left oh, a little yeah, free a time, time on the docket. Do that's it. a lot of time. Yeah, so in addition to Leffler, who, by the way, looks like someone turned a racist little girl's pony into a human, <laughs> set aforementioned Marsha Blackburn, Tom Cotton, James Lankford, and Mike Lee introduced the, quote, Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act of 2020 this week. Fuck What's that title? Your face. Yep. Which would wow. take away federal funding from any sports group that would, quote, permit a person whose sex is male to participate in an athletic program or activity that is designated for women or girls. Oh, Kelly Leffler, uh, bad news. I just passed the Protection of Humans in Sports Act, and <laughs> that doesn't permit a a senator whose species is equine to participate in making laws that are designed for people. You can make horse laws. You can still make horse laws. Yeah. yeah. Also, fuck your face. Yeah, that too. As long as we could. And one might think it's, you know, actually been a kind of tough year for Leffler. It was revealed that she sold almost $20 million worth of stock before the COVID crash. Uh, she co-owns a WNBA team where everyone fucking hates they her. They hate but her so much. They hate it's her so best. much. But don't worry. <laughs> she does have one big fan, and that would be Christian hate group leader Tony Perkins, who said of the proposed law, quote, 
I applaud Senator Leffler for introducing the Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act. Allowing boys to play on girls' sports teams is unfair, and it poses increased physical risk to girls, particularly at the high school and college levels. Senator Leffler's bill will help ensure that girls are afforded the opportunity to play on a level playing field. End quote. Yeah, yeah Leffler is just the latest Republican politician to rally her base by saying, OK, I might be a criminal, but at least I'm a bigot. Right. You bigot. Yeah. Right. But actually, if you read between the lines of Tony's statement there, I think Tony Perkins is pretty obviously challenging any female athletes out there to a fight. That's right? what I heard. I heard that. I, it wasn't even between the lines. It was in right. It, it was. Yeah. Loud. If if a female athlete tries to beat up Tony Perkins, he would win so bad it wouldn't even be fair. <laughs> so I'm just saying, if any of our listeners out there want to take Tony up on his challenge. We will arrange a Thunderdome, or as they're now called, a presidential debate. <laughs> <laughs> and in I Am the Walrus News, <laughs> Attorney General and shaved walrus William Barr spoke at the National Catholic Prayer Breakfast last week uh, and accidentally gave a speech about exactly why we should be terrified that top-level government officials are attending events called National <laughs> Prayer Breakfasts. <laughs> and his main point was that so-called militant secularists are trying to drive religion out of public policy. And, uh, yup. <laughs> <Yeah. fuck> <laughs> but Nailed it. despite being a highly educated lawyer, he didn't seem to realize that he was arguing against the founding fathers he loves so dearly in all these other topics. Also known as the militant secularists who wrote the first fucking amendment. Yeah. Or perhaps you've heard of Antifa leader Thomas Jefferson. I mean, <laughs> they, they literally build statues to this guy. I'm the attorney general. Have Not I mentioned I'm the attorney general? Not for long. General. So here's the exact words from Barr. Quote, in American public discourse, perhaps no concept is more misunderstood than the notion of separation of church and state. So far, so good. Militant secularists have long seized on that slogan as a facile justification for attempting to drive religion from the public square. Separation of church and state does not mean, and never did mean, separation of religion and civics. What? Except it literally did. To which he added, ow, who threw a thesaurus at my head? This lunch is an anarchist-controlled zone. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they Throw do. it a little more facile next time. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, that's precisely what that fucking means, you miserable yep, piece of yep. shit. Because look, Thank you. even way, the way he's trying to dress it up, religion does not mean your values or your morals. We all have those. Yep. Religion is just the dogmatic bullshit that diverges from morality or even stands in defiance of it. And if Lots that's confusing to you, don't worry. The dogmatic bits that have nothing to do with morality are the easiest ones to spot. They're the ones anybody in your religion cares about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just one other detail. During the breakfast, Barr became the latest recipient of an award they apparently give out now called the Christ of Fidelis Lychee Award. Fuck you making up your own Latin <laughs> shit. <laughs> it's real Latin, but whatever. You get that for being the Catholic layperson who best demonstrates selfless and steadfast service in the Lord's vineyard. Selfless, huh? By, mm. by exhibiting Christ-like behavior. Mm. Flip over so, a table? Congrats on the trophy, William, but I uh, hate to break it to you. You're not the carpenter man. You're the walrus in every <laughs> possible way. Yeah. You're the fucking walrus. You're the walrus. He is the walrus. And in MAD as hell news. <laughs> Medically assisted dying. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Mad yeah. Is Crushed it. Enough is enough. They're tired of hiding. The Catholic Church is ready to take on the, their words, intrinsic evil in their midst this week. And no, it's it's still not kid fucking. Really? It's not the kid it, fucking. Really? No, it's not. It's uh, it's giving last rights to chronically ill suffering Jesus people. Christ. Okay, maybe they yeah. can do a resolution in the Senate for a few weeks, but then, <laughs> and then get to that. Yeah, great. So uh, this week, the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith released its latest letter entitled "Samaritanus Bonus." This week, bonus, bonus, clarifying that no. It is not, in fact, okay to give last rites to someone who is participating in medically assisted suicide. Okay, well, that's fucking disgusting. But, you know, whatever. You just fake like you're regular dying. You get the last rites. 
And then you chug that cocktail right in their fucking face, <laughs> right? Gotcha. <laughs> Priest is like, ha, I got you. It's just, it's all fake and we just die. <laughs> oh. Okay. Double, well, double. I feel like I kind of got you both times. That's fine. <laughs> now, to be clear, they aren't just declaring this out of nowhere, although you couldn't be blamed for thinking that they just decided to say that this week. Uh, this is in response to a statement made last year by Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia, who said that priests could provide last rites to the medically assisted dying because, quote, the Lord never abandons anyone, end quote. And again, just to be clear, the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith wrote a whole letter to clarify he does fucking do. <laughs> he, he does fucking to abandon everyone. <laughs> Great. So the official position of the Vatican is that God is a, a shitty boyfriend who's afraid to break up with you so he gives you unbearable eyeball cancer until you break up with him. That's, yeah. the, that's the position. Exactly. Lovely. And it actually gets worse. So in an article published by Vatican News at the same time, Dr. Colin Hart, don't worry, not a medical doctor, said I wasn't worried. that too many people are focusing on the bad parts of suffering. Wait, what? Yeah. Quote, I don't think we speak enough about the good of suffering. Uh, I don't think that word means what you <laughs> While doing everything possible to relieve somebody's suffering, because that's part of care, to realize the suffering that cannot be relieved is valuable. It has a purpose, and it has the greatest purpose, insofar as it can be offered up in union with the sufferings of Christ for the that. good of oneself and in remission of one's own sins, and also for the good of the church and the world. Jesus Christ, he's like... He's Tom Sawyering the fence, but with pancreatic <laughs> cancer. He is. Yeah. Ah. Oh. And look, again, I don't have a fancy theological degree like Dr. <laughs> Hart does, but I do know an invitation to get kicked in the balls when I hear one. So yeah, <laughs> if you do get a chance to kick Dr. Colin Hart in the balls... Remind him that it's for the good of the church and the world. <laughs> and the world, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And while I explained to Andrew that Eli only said if you kick that guy in the nuts, which technically isn't an endorsement, we're going to pause for a word from our second sponsor this week, My Sheets Rock. Next. Hi, can I get a tall cold brew? And let me see. Uh, also 19 shots of espresso, please. Uh, Wow, sir, that's a lot of espresso. Yeah, well, you know, I'm trying not to sleep at all. You know how it is. Got to have plenty of espresso. Uh, what? No, who doesn't love sleep? Me. I'm a warm sleeper. I tend to wake up all hot and sweaty, so I've been doing so this thing where I don't... you're just not going to sleep ever again? Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's the plan. Uh, why don't you just try My Sheets Rock? Oh, look, you seem really nice. Um, I'm not saying you're not nice, but we just met. Just no, now. And, no, and like, silly. My Sheets Rock is the name of the brand. Oh. My Sheets Rock has created the regulator sheets, which are designed specifically to keep hot sleepers cool and cold sleepers comfortable. They regulate temperature, wick moisture, stay breathable, and are so soft, you'll sleep comfortably every night. That's because these sheets are made from best-in-class bamboo rayon, the holy grail of sheeting. The holy grail of sheeting? Holy wow. grail of sheeting. This miracle material transfers body heat two times more effectively than regular sheets and reduces humidity by 50%. So you can experience your best night's sleep yet. It's true. Oh, Noah, well, what are you doing in the coffee shop? Oh, I, I live in Georgia, so I just wanted to be in a universe where I could go to a coffee shop. Yeah, okay, that's fair. Plus, I wanted to tell you about My Sheets Rock. They sent us a set to try, and their sheets are so soft and smooth, it's like sleeping on an infinite slip and slide made of heartfelt compliments. Oh, that does sound good. But you're just a coffee shop employee, and I've been burned before. What if I don't believe you? Don't believe me? Their five-star customer reviews speak for themselves. Plus, they offer a 90-day risk-free trial and free shipping and returns. Check out My Sheets Rock at MySheetsRock.com slash scathing. And enter our code scathing for 10% off and free shipping. That's MySheetsRock.com slash scathing, code scathing. Thanks. When were you betrayed by a coffee shop employee? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, literally burned. I tried to drink an espresso on its way out of the machine. Like, oh, right there. yeah, no, that'll do it. Yeah. Really hurt. Well, yeah. And in Soyo Boy news, right wing conspiracy theorists and mascot for every woman who's ever screamed a racial slur at a bouncer during her bachelorette party, <laughs> Deanna Lorraine. <laughs> 
I'm Italian. What are you <laughs> exactly. talking about? Has another reason for her fans to vote for Donald Trump this week. So uh, everybody, before I tell you, get a picture of Trump in your mind. Nope. Nope. And it, it should be full body. That's important. Even noper. Okay. Go ahead and okay, Google I'm image like Trump if you need to. Nope. All right. Have you done this? Lorraine wants you to vote for Donald Trump because he is an alpha male. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, obviously she doesn't mean alpha in the profit on investment sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alpha as an edge <laughs> investment strategy. She must mean alpha as in calling for a drug test right before a fight, like a confident winner does. Yeah, right before exactly. A fight. yeah. exactly. Probably that kind so of alpha. Here's the tragic tragic quote which is such a deep insight into miss lorraine's life quote let's be honest who would you rather choose as a boyfriend or husband is it a man who's protective tall strong and alpha male someone who's going to make sure that he protects you your family your country who's tough and strong a little bit of an a-hole sometimes just a little bit or would you choose a boyfriend or a husband who's soft who's a beta male who's a soy boy who is weak Someone who doesn't stand up for his convictions. Someone who just lets everyone else steamroll him and changes his mind and flip-flops every other minute. Who isn't strong. Pretty sure that most women would choose a husband or a boyfriend who is that alpha male, and that's what Trump is. Oh, you know what? She must be talking about alfalfa because of the hair. Oh, Words okay. Are All right. Words yeah. are tricky, Deanna. Yeah. I mean, look, I've seen Melania and I've seen Jill, and one of them looks like she wants to be there, right? Holy <laughs> fuck. <laughs> What a terrifying mission. Ladies, be honest. Would you rather a guy who knocks you around a little or some pansy fuck that pronounces both the R's in library? Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So depressing insight into Deanna Lorraine's love life aside, I just want to say, as the soyest of boys, <laughs> I want to take a moment to point out that I am delightful. Okay, <laughs> Deanna Lorraine? I do the dishes without being asked. I am cuddleable from every possible <laughs> angle. Alpha cuddleable. Yeah. Alpha. Powerful cuddle. Yeah. And if Deanna Lorraine was capable of or had ever been the recipient of love, she would know that. But she isn't and hasn't. So she's just going to keep telling the InfoWars viewers that she ran into a really protective door. Oh, God. And and that honestly is punishment that not even I would wish on her. Yeah. And in the due to Biden's news tonight, <laughs> the fact that he isn't Donald Trump should be all the goddamn motivation you need. And if that doesn't do it, the fact that you don't want to hear Heath do the you should have voted for Joe Biden thing for four years should push you over the line. OK, Joe Biden wins. I'm still pointing out you should have voted for Hillary Clinton. We still have the Supreme <laughs> Court because of that from those from these four. God damn it. Go ahead. All right, but just in case not wanting to live in a theocratic idiocracy wasn't enough for you, Secular Democrats of America launched Humanists for Biden this week, an initiative specifically designed to reach out to non-religious Americans and ensure that we're represented among the Biden coalition. Okay, you had me at not theocratic idiocracy, but yeah. good stuff. Like, yeah, <laughs> I should have. That's not all I want, but... <laughs> You had me. So, yeah. So humanists for Biden will join Catholics for Biden, Hindu Americans for Biden, Muslims for Biden, believers for Biden and Latter Day Saints for Biden in reminding Americans that the other guy is a villain out of a goddamn 80s movie. Except real 80s reality. Yeah. And somehow James Spader's character becomes president. It's really, really depressing fucking <laughs> because movie. Because Molly Ringwald wasn't exciting enough. God <laughs> damn it. And in so doing, of course, it seeks to turn out non-religious Americans in record numbers and remind the Democratic Party just how important a voting bloc we could be. And look, this really matters. A lot of atheists seem to think that the fact that, like, you know, of course we're going to vote for the non-theocratic party dooms us to perpetual obscurity in the political arena. But that misunderstands politics. Right. If they know that catering to non-believers actually brings us to the polls, they will be sucking and slurping our genitals for the rest of time, mm -hmm. which, by the way, Humanist for Biden has repeatedly rejected as a slogan. I don't get yes. this <laughs> prejudice. No was up all night designing that poster. They wouldn't even look at it. They wouldn't even Fuck. look at it. Um, incidentally, if you have the good sense to eagerly await our every episode and listen to them right away, you can even catch the formal campaign launch for the Humanist for Biden thing. It's an October 1st online event, and you will find a link to sign up on the top of the show notes. So do that. And finally tonight, in Iceland Thunderfuck news, we have a story out of Iceland about a rainbow people of multiple races, and a gender-fluid Jesus Christ. Mm. 
Anna? What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. <laughs> That's right. Even in the frozen secular paradise of Iceland, Christians are having a meltdown after the Evangelical Lutheran Church posted an ad on Facebook for their Sunday school that depicted a group of interracial kids, a rainbow, and the Lord and Savior wearing face makeup and sporting a very tasteful set of breasts. Huh. <laughs> well, you, since Islam isn't uniquely harmful, I guess those people who drew it and published it got shot and killed or hacked to death with machetes, huh? <laughs> but... <sighs> so, according to the minister in charge of the ad, the gender fluidity is the whole point. They're trying to be one of those inclusive churches that still bases their worldview on a book that includes Leviticus. Yeah. So fuck you. Right. You know what? Fuck you. <laughs> fuck the conservative churches even more, but still fuck you. Stop clinging to that terrible book and just come out and say it and cancel that book and it'd be a weekly ethics club that does charity work. That'd be good. And, and you know what? Fuck you even more for your response to the freak out. The ad immediately led to a whole bunch of panicky Christians yelling about how like Jesus can't have beard and breasts at the same time. I'm, I'm sexually confused and I'm scared. And Apparently, there was enough of that yelling to make the church take down the ad and issue an apology. Really? Hmm. Because they're cowards, and they didn't realize an apology would mean that despite their good intentions at the beginning of this thing, now they've capitulated to bigots, and they owe an actual apology to everyone harmed by the implication that gender fluidity is somehow problematic and that you would need to apologize for that. Yeah, okay. Uh, our bad. When God took human form to sacrifice himself to himself... As part of the substitutional blood pact <laughs> for all the world's sins as established in Abrahamic law. He did it as a dude. We're sorry. Yeah. Yep. That's what happened. Right. But so, but there in a nutshell is the biggest problem with progressive churches, right? They normalize the conservative ones that outnumber them. Look, polishing up the bigotry to make it more palatable is immoral all by itself. Yep. Yeah, it is. And just to be clear, Lutheran Church of Iceland, I know you're listening, lots of people would argue that there's a word for person who capitulates to bigots. It's bigot. Yep. The word is yep. bigot. That's bigot. the word for that. You could argue back that you're technically bigot adjacent, I guess, but <laughs> now you're trying to win an argument by branding yourself as bigot adjacent? That's not great. <laughs> Never great. You already no. lost that argument. And you should apologize for real. And speaking as a person myself with a beard and fairly voluptuous breasts, I'm offended by everyone involved in this story. But <laughs> now that we're on the subject, let's go ahead and put 10 seconds on the clock. Slogans for the Church of Bearded and Breasted Gender Fluid Jesus, go. All right. Um, the Church of Gender Fluid Jesus, because one kind of transubstantiation isn't silly. Ooh, uh, <laughs> the Church of Gender Fluid Jesus, New Paul's Drag Race. <laughs> <laughs> the Church of Gender Fluid Jesus, the best combination of a beard and breasts since Karen Pence. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we may or may not have a new corporate logo to hammer out. So we're going to close the headlines there. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, Hillary Morgan Farrer will tell us about the fine line between women's rights and women's wrongs. We're going to shit bags. No, we're going to Applebee's. That's ridiculous. Heath, Noah, what's the matter? I want to go to shit bags for dinner. And I do not, because that sounds terrible. I want to go to Applebee's. W what do you think, Eli? Eh, I don't really like either. You you don't like either? Like, okay, shit bags serves you literal bags of shit. It's in the it's title. In, yeah, I, I know, I know. But, but I also just don't particularly like Applebee's. Can I vote for Bennigan's? I no, like Bennigan's. No, oh no, we're either going to shit bags or you can vote for Applebee's. Because Noah breaks all ties. Right, yeah. Noah breaks all ties. Okay. But if I vote for Applebee's, Heath will think it's okay to go to Applebee's and then we'll never, no, 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 ever go to Bennigan's. No, no, no. If you vote for Applebee's, we'll go to Applebee's. If you don't, we're going to shit bags. Those are the two possibilities right now. Literally, those are the only two. Okay, I get it. Because I actually read on Twitter that we will go to Bennigan's if nope, I secretly nope, write it. No, they, they are, those people on Twitter are wrong. We're telling you what's going to happen. It's one of those two things, and you get to vote for your choice between the thing you like less and eating a literal bag of shit. Hmm. 
okay, you know what? I just realized I'm busy and I, I just self-diagnosed with a mental illness, so I pass. I Fantastic. would like to pass. Okay, all right. Shit bags it is. Shit bags. Aw, man. I hate shit bags. I have no yeah. idea how this happened and nobody should ever try to explain it to me. Okay. Voting. Like it or not, that's the way it fucking is. <sighs> Indeed. I bet you secretly like shit bags, Heath. <laughs> <laughs> Several months ago, we got through the portion of Mama Bear apologetics that related to Mama Bears and apologetics. We have long since moved on to the portion where the conversation is over and she just won't hang up the goddamn phone and we're starting to consider being rude about it. <laughs> All right. So, oh, man. Anyway. <laughs> I got to do a dusting. What? <laughs> and, of course, the latest one other thing that pissed her off brings us to this week's chapter on feminism. And to discuss that one, we're excited to welcome in my lovely wife, Lucinda. Lucinda, welcome back. Damn it. I thought I was going to make it a whole year without having to read one of these fucking books, you guys. Yeah, <laughs> sorry <laughs> about that. Uh, and, we, and you got to do it on your birthday, too. I know. So tell us, Eli, aside from your attempt to be the only married person on the podcast, why is Lucinda <laughs> here? Well, Noah, as you tease, that would be because this chapter is called The Future is Female. That's right. This week, we're taking on feminism. About time. And by we, I mean three of this book's contributors. It took, three? Yep. It took them three authors to write this chapter. Wow. I mean, more efficient than Shakespeare, but still oh, like three. <laughs> All right. It's like they were trying to prove women weren't up to the job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. And we're going to start with the Women's March of 2017. Yes. Mm -hmm. According to our cabal of authors, the largest organized protest in American history up to that point was actually a big loss for women. Not a lot of people know that. They say, huh. quote, might we suggest that millions of women wearing symbols of their privates on their head and gleefully what? screaming, I'm a nasty woman, was a massive failure for the cause of female empowerment and an especially devastating loss in the Dignity Department. Yeah. End quote. Those hats really gave away the secret about vagina color. And uh, <laughs> as we all know, that's where women keep their dignity. So that's a big loss. Huh. Um, also, just curious, was the book... Asking permission to write a sentence in itself <laughs> said, might we suggest just start your sentence, just say your thing. Uh, it, it was probably asking its husband. Oh, yep. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. But don't get these authors wrong. They like some feminism. For instance, they like the feminism of the Bible. Quote. As Christians, we are thankful for a God who gave woman honoring mandates that broke with the traditions of culture, end quote. <laughs> well, yeah, if you think about it, sex slave is better than murdered, yeah. ar arguably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, what they don't like is modern feminism, about which one of the authors says, quote, their talk of resisting the patriarchy seems strange to someone like me who has brothers and knows firsthand the struggles that men endure <laughs> often at the hands of women. What? And, well, okay. That's an interesting new angle. I'm the fucking worst and I'm a woman, so feminism is dumb. I guarantee that's the best argument in the chapter. Yeah, right? That's a ridiculous <laughs> argument. Guarantee it's the best one. It's pretty solid. It's pretty solid. She continues, quote, and in my opinion, the latest version of the movement forfeited all mortal high ground when it decided to die on the hill of abortion, a practice which ironically harms more baby girls than baby boys, end quote. Huh. OK, well, ironically and not ironically, you just misused ironically. So that's uh -huh. fun. Mm -hmm. Well, unless you find it wryly amusing that <laughs> the misogyny heavily caused by religion leads to more abortion of female fetuses. Is that wry to you? It's a real wine sipper. Yeah. So they <laughs> they spend, you know, two and a half pages bitching about how pro-life protesters were uninvited from the Women's March. And then they spend another page saying that they didn't want to go to it anyway. And so now it's time for a brief history of feminism. Oh, it starts with the apple, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, oh, oh, how I wish. So our little tribe of authors, are they're going to break feminism down into three waves for us. Um, and for those familiar with the Internet, that is never a good sign. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if someone ever refers to second or third wave feminism, 
you're pretty much guaranteed that they mean ungrateful bitches who weren't satisfied with being able to vote. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. pretty very much, it. much. And they are just going to immediately prove Lucinda correct there. Their very first sentence cites philosopher Christina Hoff Summers. Oh, <laughs> philosopher. Is that what she is. Christina Hoff Summers. OK, great. Yeah. And for my next chapter about George Washington's army, I'd like to start with a quote from Benedict Arnold. <laughs> Does that sound good? Yeah. For those unfamiliar, Summers is the author of the anti-feminist book, Who Stole Feminism? in which she asked hard-hitting questions like, is fucking someone while they're too drunk to consent really rape? And she makes arguments like you weren't allowed to hit your wife that hard, quit whining. She does. She really does. (sighs) Fucking idiot. But yeah, according to our three authors, and I guess also Rape Apology Barbie Summers as well, the original (laughs) feminists didn't want equality. God forbid. Yeah, Yeah, literally. Quote, These feminists affirmed the unique role of women in society, especially as caregivers and nurturers. They fought for equal worth, dignity, and rights as fellow members of the human race without forfeiting their communal identity as women. End quote. I I, I love how this fails to be an argument for separate but equal only because she's stopping short of equality. Yeah. 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 Separate. It's an argument for separate. It's an argument for separate. And I should be clear. That the first wave of feminism is where the three authors of this chapter think good feminism ended. Oh. Yeah. That's that they were like voting and that's it. So wow. now we're gonna talk about the second wave of feminism. Uh anger, bargaining. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so close, Heath. Hippies. HPV. Yeah. Got it. Uh, yep. Quote. Second wave feminists consistently downplayed the unique role of women in society and instead focused on the message of self-determination and autonomy. In other words, I am my own boss and I do what I want, including with my body, end quote. Yeah. And again, to be clear, the authors of this chapter think that is a bad thing. That's That's bad. That's That's bad. bad. That's phase two is now bad. Okay, yeah. (laughs) Evil phase two consent that is <laughs> ambitious to start your section you gotta dig out of that hole that you don't know you're in great wow but but you see much to these evil second wave feminists dismay many women still chose to stay home being mothers and wives yeah we hate when women choose exactly yeah <laughs> well, their only explanation was that there must be some kind of oppressive system in place that was invisibly holding women back. <laughs> the patriarchy. Invis- invisible. I love man. the use of invisibly. Like, the year was invisibly 1987. Jesus fucking <laughs> Christ. You're the theist. Someone yep. with invisible. Yeah. We're playing with invisible now? <laughs> <laughs> and you're probably wondering, okay, who are these radical feminists they're talking about. Why? Mm -hmm. None other than Antifa extremist herself, Betty Friedan. Really? (laughs) Who wrote The Feminine Mystique. Quote, granted, she made several legitimate critiques of the 1950s housewife stereotype, but as in most corrective movements, she swung the pendulum too far in the opposite direction. Too much equality. (laughs) Yeah, I want to know her other examples of those movements. Comparing the lives of the average American housewife to being a comfortable concentration camp. Oh, oh my God. (laughs) As if decorating a Pinterest board with fun meal ideas is at all comparable to the Holocaust. And yeah, that's what she was bitching about. Yeah. (laughs) Good critique. Betty Friedan's 1963 book, Completely Misunderstood Pinterest. So, yeah, (laughs) solid. But just to be clear, the feminist mystique is based on noticing that pretty much all the graduates of Smith College, one of the top colleges in the country, all those graduates were housewives with no income of their own. It was an all-women's school. Ferdinand went Godwin for one sentence. Yes, that was a ridiculous sentence. But that sentence is the entire discussion from Hillary Morgan here. Yes, yes. Al. Yes. <laughs> and now it's time for third wave feminism, or as she titles it, This Means War. Oh, shit. And what's great about this section about third wave feminism is that they used up all their feminism has gone too far stuff on the 1960s. <laughs> so their criticism of feminist third wave is just it's the second wave, but louder <laughs> and and communist, which, again, is very bad. Oh. It's bad <laughs> and communist. OK, so just to review the history of feminism, <laughs> according to this book, is voting, which was good. And then consent, 
which was bad, and uh-huh. then Marxist consent. <laughs> also Even worse. It, it gets so bad that they conclude this section on the third wave of feminism with, I shit you not, a link to Christina Hoff Summers' YouTube channel. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Links Gross. to YouTube channels for when your readers aren't really readers. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll find this TikTok answers any questions you might have. <laughs> About the history of feminism. Right. So now it's time to remind Heath that you don't need a license to drive an anagram. So we're going <laughs> to roar like a mother. Starting with R, recognize the message. So get ready because we're going to deal with the evil messages of feminism, starting with girl power. Jesus, what's next? Is she going to go after the myth that you're deserving of love? <laughs> uh, spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> And their argument against girl power is that it's reverse sexism. Of course Uh, it is. Quote, you never see the term boy power on anything. (laughs) Oh, God damn it. No, that's true. Uh, We we just call it power. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Fuck that. That's called toxic masculinity. And they make pills for that these days. Really? What? What? Estrogen? (laughs) She explains that in the footnote. What she means by pills for that is that boys are diagnosed with ADD more often. Oh, is that the one she meant? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, the underdiagnosing of female psychological problems sure is a problem for men. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really hard for us. Bums us right out. We have it rough, Lucinda. Rough, (laughs) rough. So hard. Glad you're here to sympathize. Uh, All right, evil (laughs) feminist (laughs) message number two: Stop the war on women. Mm. To which, again, their counter argument is, well, there's technically only a war on women if you count reproductive rights and we don't. So there. (laughs) Oh, we just don't. Cool. (laughs) Ah. Hey, guys, listen, don't don't complain. We're about to get another woman on the Supreme Court. So, well, she's waging a war against female reproductive rights. Mm. But that doesn't count. I said that doesn't count. That doesn't count. (laughs) Otherwise, besides that, she's a feminist. Mm Mm-hmm. With a literal handmaid. Okay, message three. What's message three? Let's keep typing. All right, yeah. So message number three, men are superfluous. True story. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you ever watch lesbian porn? They look so happy. So happy. So, yeah, they're having a blast. And I want to point out, they get specific here. Their problem isn't with the idea that the world doesn't need men. It's that women don't need men, but, right? They're they're making the affirmative claim that women need men, all women. Mm-hmm. So much. All right, so now it's time to O, offer discernment. Uh, and they're going to start out by admitting that, yeah, I guess it's not great to be a woman. You think? Well, with the child brides and the murder and the rape and stuff. And yes, they are grateful for feminism because that's why they can write this book and vote and shit. But, but, and and this is seriously their butt. Patriarchy, according to the dictionary, is when you are owned by your father, and that's not a bad thing. What? Uh, Isn't it? Quote, the patriarchal structure was intended to be protective, not oppressive. Oh, oh okay. It's a safety issue. Mm. Like Women used to be safer for all of history Must have been. right now. Must have been, or that would be a nonsense point. statement. Yeah. Plus, the other option was worrying our pretty little heads off, and you know that doesn't sound <laughs> pleasant at all. <laughs> Fuck that. Yeah, so now it's time for the lies of contemporary feminism. Lie number one. Our seemingly democratic society is really about men controlling women. Uh, let me guess. Their counter argument is nah. <laughs> yep, just nah. But also, they point out that one time a bunch of men told them what feminism was on Twitter. Men, how crazy is that? <laughs> so, <laughs> next lie: the right to complete autonomy trumps even the right to life. So, pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, right. No, clearly she's saying that if my kidneys fail, I am morally justified harvesting one of hers as long as it doesn't kill her. Check. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Moral equivalent. Fuck. The lie after that, feminism freed women. And, and while they admit that this is partially true, again, voting, writing the book, but <laughs> counterpoint, women are whores now. What? Uh, yep. Quote. As sexual promiscuity became the norm, many men stopped feeling pressured to commit and instead live lives of extended adolescence, playing video games and getting all the guilt-free, consequence-free sex they could ever want. 
how is this better for women? End quote. I, um, also the guilt-free sex and and the video games? I don't get the question. <laughs> yeah. That sounds great for everybody. Yeah, what? I'm supposed to beat all the boss fights on Luigi's Mansion myself? Fuck yeah, you, lady. Right. <laughs> Good shit to do. Sense of bitches. <laughs> and the final lie of feminism, anger is power. Huh? Because so many feminists they know are mad at them. <laughs> so, like a lie. Dedicated. Fantastic. Uh, so now it's time to A, argue for a healthier approach than feminism. We're yep. going to argue yes, for a healthier exactly. approach. Right? So first, we need to recognize that there is no one size fits all version of feminism. Now, let me let me guess here. She is not talking about intersectionality with Black Lives Matters and trans rights. <laughs> not, no. <laughs> no. What are you feeling you're going to be right about no. that one? No. That. Uh, no, she's going more for you can be pro-life and still call yourself a feminist. Uh, yeah, figure. There it is. You're legally, yeah. yes, yeah. it's not a protected <laughs> term. Yeah. <laughs> All righty then. Number two, she wants us to have compassion for angry feminists, but not their ideas. Quote, usually these women are scared, hurt, and bear emotional wounds buried deep within. It might be easy for us to mock them, but that doesn't set a good example for our kids. Demolish the ideas while loving the person. End mm. quote. God, what what does it say about your readership? Would you feel the need to constantly remind them to exhibit basic humanity? Right? <laughs> yep. Also, if the only reason to do that is the example for your kids, that's fucking ridiculous. Right? And... That means Hillary's not going to do yeah, it. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> also, Hillary Morgan Fair, you have my 100% permission to mock feminism. I would love to. <laughs> I'm done having property. <laughs> yeah, you fucking got her, hell dog. Fucking got her. Look at my bank account. That's you. You said like that. <laughs> All four of my girls got together to write this one. <laughs> so now we're going to R reinforced through discussion, discipleship, and prayer. Mm. And we're starting with discussing God-given gender differences. Quote, if you have boys, talk to them about how one day they will be bigger and stronger than you. But how will they use their strength to protect rather than control and exploit? Mm. Talk to little girls about how they might one day be surrounded by men who are bigger and stronger than they are. How might they stand up for themselves and be strong Without emasculating the men around them. What? It doesn't take much. <laughs> be sure to talk to your daughters also about the most polite ways to ask not to be beaten up, by the way. Yeah, Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah, just in time for fucking Halloween. Right. Did she just tell her audience to talk with their daughters about a bukkake scene? Because that's what it sounded like. <laughs> but a self-assured one, Heath. A self-assured uh, uh, Okay. Uh, you know, an alpha bukkake yeah. scene. Alpha female bukkake. Yeah. Actually, that sounds... Anyway, moving on. <laughs> and finally... They're going to talk about how healthy gender relationships begin at home. Quote, let them see us treating their fathers and our husbands with respect. Let them see what it looks like to submit to leadership without being doormats or losing our unique voice. End quote. Jesus. So now it's time to pause for prayer. Fucking what? Oh, yeah. Sorry, Lucinda. Great you question, here. Lucinda. <laughs> Great uh, yeah. question. Yeah. Pause, bears. It's a whole thing. It's. The fucking been verse. throughout the book. And, and this one, by the way, is a doozy. Their prayer for this chapter begins, I praise you, the triune Godfather, Son, and Holy Spirit for having different roles, yet being equal. See? Uh, yeah? Yeah? It's good <laughs> enough for Jesus. <laughs> Fuck. And then later she adds, forgive me when my desire for autonomy and self-determination Override submission to your plan for me. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Yeah. Forgive me for having a mind of my own. Yeah. If that was a BDSM scene, you should rightly stop it and be like, you okay? You having an okay day? <laughs> <Same word? laughs> you want to talk? <laughs> All right. So now it's time for some discussion questions. Right. Number one, icebreaker. What are some of the best things about being a woman and some of the most frustrating things? Okay, it's the guilt-free sex in the video games because of Marxism. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Um, the best thing about being a woman is, I don't know, access to the secret lounge. Wait, what? You know Wait, the ooh. one. You know the ones, ladies. Most frustrating is maybe not quite this chapter of this book, but it's in the top <laughs> 10 now. Yep, fair. What do you have in those lounges? Yeah. You know you've got some cool shit in there. Then, yeah. I'm telling you, gotta go undercover. Ah, oh, I'd love Number to see two. that. 
Main theme. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> Feminists have gone from addressing legitimate grievances to being grievance collectors. Ultimately, men and women are created with equal worth and dignity in the image of God. Do you think Christians should call themselves feminists? Why or why not? <laughs> okay, well, the only pages of the Bible that don't literally fail the Bechdel test are those, you know, blank pages for rolling joints at the end. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, the book of Timothy says... This book that we're talking about by three women is illegal. Yeah. Yeah. We shouldn't even be talking about this. Really? I, don't, I don't know how we're talking about this. Well, notice, it's unchristian. Notice that she talks about equal worth and equal dignity rather than equal rights. As though as long as something's equal, we should be happy with it. Right. Look, everybody gets the same amount of syrup in the ramekin, regardless of their gender. Now quit your bitching. <laughs> <laughs> what? Just order two ramekins at the beginning. I'll bring it to you. God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> Number three, self-evaluation. Let's consider another spectrum. And you guys know what's coming. Uh, On a sheet of paper, draw a line. Does she yeah. have stock in a paper mill or something? Why must we draw so goddamn many lines on so goddamn many pieces of paper? Is she mad at trees? <laughs> Who has paper? <laughs> loose paper next to them is 2020. I hope he so, does. I have so much loose paper next to them. It's really kind of That's sad. That's weird. All right. So here's what you want. You draw your line and then you label one end Doormat Doris. Of course you do. Of course. Yep. Yeah. And the other end Man Hater Molly. Oh, God damn. <laughs> Where do you think you fall on the spectrum and why? The ecstasy part. Guys. <laughs> Guys, did I just mishear you or did this book just imply that the opposite of doormat is hates men. <laughs> like, yep. like you have to be careful not to have too much self worth or you'll hate men. Yeah, right. That's the what <laughs> is happening. Yep. There's so many great reasons to hate men. That's so dumb. <laughs> right. Anyway. All right. Number four, brainstorm. Compile a list of as many positive effects of feminism that you can think of. <laughs> now, do the same with negative effects. Oh, I didn't draw a line on a piece of paper. So didn't say <laughs> draw now I'm completely lost. What are we supposed to like? I, I can't even conceive of what this question is going to be. How can we stand up for a biblical femininity without affirming the lies in modern feminism? All right. Well, I guess while well, we brainstorm about all the negative consequences of female equality, as suggested by this book, we're going to close that motherfucker for now. Hard, probably, but there's still more of it. So with a special thanks to Lucinda, we're going to wrap up this edition of God Awful Books. You are not welcome. No. Before we water down the embers tonight, I wanted to let you know that the book should be available for pre-order in the next couple of days. We have to wait for a few approvals and the timing on that can vary, but keep an eye out on our Facebook page and at PIAT Pod on Twitter. As soon as it's available, we'll have links there. And if you intend to get the book on any format, we'd strongly urge you to pre-order as that makes it really good for us when they're trying to decide like where we rank as the book launches. Again, the title you're going to be looking for is Outbreak, A Crisis of Faith, How Religion Ruined Our Global Pandemic. Available soon on ebook, audiobook, and good old-fashioned just book. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday, and an even new episode of our half-sister show citation needed debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, this episode wouldn't merit a number if I neglected to thank Keith Enright for being the brains of the operation, Lucid Illusions for being the heart of the show, and Eli Bosnick for being the gallbladder of our company. I also need to thank the Turnip of Terror for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. And if you're dying to know why he calls himself that, be sure to check out the link to his website on the show notes. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best bipeds, Diego Rowan, the infamous Molly Cottle, Jay Torgo, Thomas, Greg, Matthew, Matt, Marshall, Sharon, Amy, Angus, Brooks, and Corey. Tiago Rowan, Molly J, and Torgo, whose IQs give the Hindu goddess Durga digit envy. Thomas, Greg, Matthew, Matt, and Marshall, whose cocks are so massive their condoms have to be built at sea. And Sharon, Amy, Angus, Brooks, and Corey, who are so desirable that the doggy in the window has a song about how much they are. Together, these 15 phenomenally fuckable freethinkers forewent furtherance of their financial foundation this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the wherewithal or therewithal that it takes to give us money, but if you think you're up to the challenge, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash 
slash getting atheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad free version of every episode. Or you can make a one time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at skatingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but not in a having less money kind of way, be sure to leave us a five star review. Follow at PIATPod on Twitter and tell a friend about the show. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media. Our audio engineer is Morgan Clark. We also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at skatingatheist.com. I, I am sure the problem's me, just to be clear. I'm not, I, I do I not think sure that, that wires don't, don't work, work yeah. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.